as I got to this new section in James, this week I've just thoroughly just been convicted in some areas and also just um, as the Lord's worked on my heart, I, I've longed to bring this message to you this morning. Now, we, we've been in James for a little while, and, and just it's time for a quick review. I'd like to review, just as we, we get to each new section in James, and we've seen that James has called us, called all of those that would, that would read, that would hear this book, he's called us to respond to life right, with a showing or demonstrating that we have faith in Jesus Christ. And how we act demonstrates that faith. And we demonstrate that faith that we have in how we respond to trials. We respond to trials with joy. We respond to trials even even though they're hard and they're tough. We respond in joy because we know that those trials producing are, are producing endurance. Right? The ability to, to endure this world, to resist sin. And as we continue to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and we resist sin and we grow in our endurance, it produces this perfect result, which is maturity in Jesus Christ. And we see that that's a way that we live out our faith is how we respond to trials. And James says, even blessed is a man who perseveres under trials. And then James says, in, in ver- later on in chapter 1, excuse me, he says that if you, if you fail in trials, in verses 13 through 15, then don't, don't blame God because of your failings. God's good. Things He sends are good. Even the trials that He sends in your life are for a good purpose. But when you fall and you fall into sin, it's because of you've given in to the flesh. It's your own fault. James says, don't blame God. He says, sin begins on the inside and works outward. As we respond poorly to the trials, as we respond poorly to the temptations in our life. And James continues and he says that you should be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. That you should receive the word of God and you should listen, you should obey, you should respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And then he moves on and he says, as we've been going through the last couple of weeks, that you should not show partiality, that you should not show favoritism. And you see this favoritism or this partiality shown in the, in the hearts and the actions of, of men and women in this world, the, the isms, right? the racism, the sexism, right? the, the ageism, all of those isms. Right? And James says, look, this show impartiality towards one group or discriminating against another group is inconsistent with the nature of who God is. He's an impartial God, judges each man on their sin or their righteousness in Jesus Christ. And so James has challenged us knowing that ultimately we will, as believers, stand before the Bema judgment seat of Christ. There will be accountability, and we talked about that last week. There's accountability for the Christian. And James expects, and God expects us to live out our faith. And that brings us to a new section. And now the new section of James, verses 14 through 26, is a, is a, is a great section because it kind of sums up one of the main themes of James, and that's, if you have faith, it should have deeds. If you have faith, there should be a demonstration of that faith in your life. And so James challenges these believers. And just as he challenges us that, that faith without actions is, is dead and useless faith. Like I had a friend growing up that he went to church, went to Bible studies, and, and but yet he still lived a life of debauchery outside of the church. He would say one thing and he would do another. And when confronted about that, he would always go back and say, well, I was saved or I was baptized when I was 10 years old. I made a profession of faith. I'm okay. Well, he wasn't living consistently with Scripture. James says that type of profession means nothing if there is no works that back it up. If your life doesn't show it, James actually says that's dead faith. And my friend later on got saved 
well, later on in his life, and he would readily admit these things. You see, there, there's always individuals in churches. There's always goats among the sheep. Some of you may be like my friend, unfortunately. You may have rest on your laurels, so to speak, in the sense that I said a prayer or, or I was baptized when I was 10 years old, but then the rest of your life hasn't, hasn't been consistent with Scripture. Just because you, you, you say a prayer doesn't mean you're necessarily in the, a Christian. Now, we have many of you, including me, we have friends, family members, sisters, brothers, parents, children that at one time or another have made a profession of faith, but yet we look at their lives and there's no real evidence. And this is a hard truth, but the sad reality in so many churches is they're not willing to confront those believers, or excuse me, confront that unbiblical idea of faith, which is really just simple belief. Anybody can claim to be a Christian, just like the old saying, you can go stand in a, a garage but it doesn't make you a car. You can claim anything you want. And, and James is addressing these kind or this kind of mentality where people want to claim to be a Christian, but there's no evidence in their lives. Look, as believers, we're, we're not judging their motives or even judging their profession. We're fruit inspectors. Matthew 7 says that we judge by the same standard that we ourselves are judged. And that standard is God's Word. We are to be fruit inspectors in each other's lives, to hold each other accountable in love. Look, James says in this section, as we're going to dig in and see, that faith without deeds is not saving faith. Too many think that the sinner's prayer is like some magic formula you say that when you get up to heaven, you can, you can recite this formula and St. Peter's going to open the gates like open sesame. But Jesus says himself in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What we'll see as we go through this section of Scripture verses 14 through 26, over the next couple weeks, we'll see that the main point is faith without conduct is worthless. In fact, this whole section, James repeats this theme over and over and over. In verse 17, he says that this is dead faith. In verse 20, he says it's useless faith. And then at the end, verses, in verse 26, he says it's dead faith. Now, there are some hard verses in this section, and there have been many a believer that have stumbled over these verses, but when you read this section, you have to remember that everything that is said, all of these verses, not taken, sorry, taken in their proper context, they all relate back to James' theme, and his theme is that faith without deeds, without actions, is dead, it's useless, it's dead, and he repeats that. So as we get in and as we look at these verses, and we'll, we'll get to some hard ones over the next couple of weeks, just remember that that theme drives this section, and it all fits into James' argument. But today, we're only going to be able to look at it about half of it. We'll look through verses 14 through 20. We're going to be looking at useless belief, titled this message, Useless Belief, and we're going to see that, number one, faith without deeds is useless verses 14 through 17. And then we're going to see that orthodox belief alone is useless in verses 18 through 20. So let's go ahead and read the text, and then we'll, we'll dig into it. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace... Be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body? What use is that? Verse 17, Even so, that faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, but the demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? 
So the, the first point or the first thing that James is saying here is that faith without deeds is useless. In verse 14, he, he offers up two rhetorical questions to, to open this section. And he wants you to, to be thinking about this. This is kind of a way to get your attention. And he says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, no deeds? Can that faith save him? He offers up these two questions. And, and he makes this just a general principle. If someone says, he's not picking on one particular pe- person, excuse me, because he knows, and this is going to be a circular letter going to many churches, and he knows within all those churches, there are going to be those that proclaim Christ but have no actions to back it up. And he says, well, what use is it? The word there for use is what what benefit, what gain, what profit. In other words, he's saying, what good is it? It's kind of like what Jesus says in one sense, Matthew 16, 26. What will it profit? What will it gain? What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What use is faith? Right, what, the goal of faith is salvation. What, what use is it? What goal is it? What good is it if it doesn't have deeds that back it up? Right, it's mental. It's verbal assent. And just so you're clear, I'm going to stay away from the word works because in our Christian culture, and this is not a bad thing, but in Christian, we've, we've, we've taken the word works and we, we relate it to a works righteousness. We, we use and we often think of works the way Paul uses it in Romans and Galatians. We think of it, oh, you're trying to earn your salvation. And that's not what James is saying. The word in Greek is, is energon, and it just has to do with actions and deeds. Works can be good or bad. In fact, James has actually laid out good works already in this book. He says that, that works that you do or you endure. You persevere in verse 12. You, you, you exhibit personal holiness in verse 21 of chapter 1. You, you obey Scripture as you're a doer of the Word. You, you have compassion and love for the needy. Verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1. You, you show impartiality in verses 1 through 13 of chapter 2. These are, these are good works, good deeds, good actions that you do that are a result of an inward change. Right? The result of an, of an inward change. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul tells t- Titus, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope of the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from every lawless work or lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works or good deeds. Right? So there's, there's good deeds and there's bad deeds. Right? So James is using works here in a, in a general sense, or sorry, he's using it in the sense of, of after you have been saved, after you have professed Jesus Christ, where is the evidence in your life? There can be good and bad works. And then James asks that, that second question, and this is the key one. It's, can that faith, that verbal assent to the truths of Scripture, just that plain verbal sin with no corresponding actions, can that faith say, save him? Excuse me. And now, this isn't a, a, just an academic question. It's important ramifications. You think about save and salvation, it's rescue from judgment. James has already said in, in verse one, sorry, chapter 1 and verse 18 that he's brought us forth by the word of truth. Right? He's, he's birthed us. We have a new birth in Christ. He says that faith comes by what? Receiving the Word of God as we hear. Now, when you come to the judgment, it won't be that the profession alone that proves your actions. Just because you say, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean you'll be able to enter heaven. It's about, do you have the corresponding faith that goes along with your profession? And that's why I call this useless belief. Right? It's, it's mental and verbal assent to truths without the corresponding heart and life change. And James says it very specifically. He says, can that faith, can that simple belief 
the, the verbal and mental assent that he says in the first part of verse 14. Can that person be saved? Or is that person saved? Is that true faith? And James wants you to say no. It's rhetorical. He wants you to agree with him. Right? He, uses, he uses that article, that faith. He's talking about that specific faith, that specific false faith or useless belief. You see, true faith is, is trusting on Jesus Christ for salvation, apart from your works, trusting on His work on the cross, satisfied God's demands on the law and, and satisfied God's wrath in your place. Through Christ, you're reconciled to God. You have redemption. You have forgiveness of sins. Right? And then it's demonstrated by your life. If you love me, you obey my commands, Jesus said. So James, when he talks about this faith at the beginning, I'm just trying to make sure you're clear. This is, this is mental. This is a verbal assent, a profession. And can it save? Does it have the power, James says? Is it able to save? And the answer is, is no. Belief without submission to Christ's demands isn't saving faith. Think about it this way. When, how many of you guys have ever tried to buy a car or a house or something big? What's one of the things that the, the bank or the credit lenders do? They, they want to verify your identity, right? And you have to submit document after document. They want to know that who you say you are is really who you are, right? So this is James here, and he says, you know, brethren, your, your actions... Show us who you claim to be. The old phrase, the, the proof is in the pudding, right? You, you say you're a great cook. Well, let me taste some of your dishes. The proof is in the pudding. James says, faith without works, faith without deeds is dead faith, is useless faith. It's a useless profession. And then James gives a great illustration. And he wants to illustrate this in a, in a very easy way that we all can, can relate to. And he says... If a brother or sister is without clothing, in verse 15, in need of daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And he's saying basically, look, there's someone that's in the congregation, that's in desperate need. Right? They have not the clothing, they're, they're cold and hungry. They're, there's someone that, that you find out about that, that is in desperate need, and he knows he says a brother or sister, it doesn't matter. You find out they're in desperate need. And your priority as a Christian is to demonstrate your love for them. Demonstrate, if you love God, then you'll demonstrate that love in how you treat others. And James says, look, you, you give them kind of a, a useless benediction. You say, you say uh, go in peace. And interesting, because that, that was a common expression in the Jewish community, in a Jewish church. Go Shalom. Go in peace. It was a, as a kind benediction. You're basically, it's a prayer that God would take care of all their needs. But what it really is, and really James is saying here, it's religious cover not to act. In fact, we do this today. Someone who's in great need, and, they'll, and you may find out about it, and you say, brother or sister, I'll pray for you. Why don't you do something about it? And then James points this out. And he says, look, it's, it's religious cover. right? It shows, a, it shows an indifference to the, the plight of someone who you call brother and sister. Be warmed and filled. That's interesting because you can either take it, and this is for Jordan, you can either take it middle or passive in the Greek. If it's, if it's in the middle, he's basically saying, hey, go warm yourselves or go, go feed yourselves. Go work harder. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you won't be, you won't be cold and hungry. Or if it's in the passive sense, and you can take it either way, is, is let someone else take care of you. Oh, well, God's going to take care of you. The, the speaker's saying this, so he's not going to, to make the necessary uh, actions himself to take care of this person. And James wants this example, this illustration to be shocking, because we can't imagine that. If you have true love of God in your heart and true love for others, there's no way you're going to look at a poor brother and sister and say that. Oh, I'll pray for you. Or, or go be warm and fail, feel, let somebody else take care of you. Or go take care of yourself. And see, what James is saying here is that with this illustration is what use is your words if there's no action behind it? And that's why he uses this illustration. You say you're a Christian. You say you love their brother and sister but you're not even demonstrating it. 
What use is, is, is those words of saying, go be in peace and go be in field? Does, does you say in those words actually do anything to help that brother or sister? No. And just for James' point, he wants to, wants to shock you. Because nobody would say that if you're truly a Christian. And I like what he says. He says it again. He says, what use is it? He repeats it again. What use? Right? What, what, what is it good for? Your, your words mean nothing if you're not willing to help somebody. And it raises the question, anyone who would say these things, it, it should raise the question of their spiritual state. One of the commentaries I read says, The, the imper- imperfections of this world provide a great opportunity to test the genuineness of our faith. But James continues, and he says, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Now, one thing about this verse, James is drawing an uh, uh, analogy, and he says, Even so, so he's saying, like, just like if you were to tell a fellow brother and sister, Hey, go in peace, be warm and fail, but not do anything about it. He says, even so, that person who says they have faith, it's not really alive. It's a dead faith. It's by itself. There's nothing to, to demonstrate it's real in their lives. Now, just so I'm clear and just so you're clear about James, he's not depreciating faith. There's no conflict between James and the Apostle Paul, as, as some liberal commentators will say. He's talking about a conflict between faith and works, faith by itself, works by itself. Sorry, a faith and a living faith and a dead faith. I apologize. He's he's contrasting living faith, which is faith that exhibits work, with dead faith, which faith that that it's verbal and mental assent or verbal proclamation without anything backing it up. That's the contrast, and he calls this useless again. He says it's dead. And it's belief accompanied by no actions. Now, one thing about this verse, and I like the King James. I have Psalms memorized in the King James when I was a kid. But one of the things about some of these older versions is they, they leave out the article in verse 17 before faith. There's an article there, and it says, it should say, even so, that faith or the faith. He's not, he's not uh, a going against faith in general. James would readily admit that you're saved By grace through faith. But what he's saying, he's referring back to, and he says, that faith, the faith that he has been talking about in verse 14. He says, if you have that faith, the the mental ascent alone, then he says, "It's, it's dead. It's dead faith cannot produce deeds that are good, deeds that are are righteous. It's it's defective faith. It's just mental ascent. Verbal profession alone cannot change the heart. And that's when he says, inwardly dead, he says that it's it's by itself. There's there's no corresponding actions. It's just like if you were to tell that poor person, be warm and filled, but not do anything about it. It's without deeds. You see, faith without deeds is not saving faith. It's dead faith. And you know what? It's dead to anyone. Because ultimately faith, the goal of faith is is eternal life. If you have simple belief in just the truths, but no heart change, then it doesn't accomplish anything. It's dead. And it leads to eternal death, eternal separation from God forever in the lake of fire. Look, I I love the Christmas season. It's one of my favorite times of the year. And one of the things I enjoyed as a kid is we would, we would go and get a real live Christmas tree. And, you know, we, we'd decorate it and, and put the lights on it, the whole, whole deal. And I loved walking in our living room, you know, those, those days leading up to Christmas. And, you, and our living room was, you could close it off and you could you open the door and, oh, the pine would just, the pine smell would hit you in the face. Oh, what a wonderful, I'm just still bring back memories as I'm thinking about it at this moment. I mean, just a wonderful, wonderful experience having the, that live Christmas tree. Well, there have been times in my life when we've had the artificial ones. And, you know, it's just not the same. And, you know, you don't, you don't get all the, the characteristics of that live tree. And you think about a, an artificial tree, it looks like a tree. You can even spray some spritz on it and make it smell like a tree. Or you have lights on it like a tree, but is it really a tree? No, it's plastic. It's fake. It's not real. And that's James's point. Here that 
You can look like a Christian. You can sound like a Christian, right? Just like you can quack like a duck, but it doesn't make you a duck. It doesn't make you a Christian. Faith without deeds is worthless. It's useless. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's not real. Mental sin and verbal profession does not on its own demonstrate faith in the heart. Spiritually dead people with dead faith do not produce good works. Spurious Odiades says that Christianity is not getting a few notions into our heads, but it is a change of the seat of all our affections and our dispositions. It's a change of the heart. True, we begin with the head, but it travels to the heart, and from the heart we travel to the hand. You see, it costs nothing to become a Christian. We're saved by God's grace but it cost everything to live as one. And so James says that faith without deeds, without actions, it's useless. And then he says in verse 18 through 20 that orthodox belief alone is useless. Look at verse 18. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. But you, excuse me, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? So James is laying out an argument. I do it myself from time to time as I'm thinking through something. Many of you do the same thing. You're thinking through something. You you raise objections kind of in your own mind. You know, all right, if I do this, somebody's going to say this, and what's going to be my response? And and so James lays this out because he knows there's going to be objectors because he's writing this to a multitude of churches, and he knows that someone's going to, to respond and say, but wait, but wait, but wait. And so James writes out their objections. And this is a hard verse because in the Greek, there are no quotation marks. And so you'll find, and even in different versions of the Bible, so quotation marks, nobody really knows where to put them. But I believe that the objector is saying this particular, particular phrase, he's saying, you have faith and I have works, and stop there. All right, so James is saying that he knows that someone's going to say, you have faith and I have works. And he responds and he says, show me your faith without the works and I will show you by my faith by my works. So what, what does that mean? What is the objector saying? The objector is saying, look, he's saying like, you have faith and I have works. He's saying they're, they're the same thing. Like you, James, you're saying that you have faith with works, but I'm saying I have faith without works. Some people have faith and some people have works. They're all equally good. It doesn't prove that I'm a Christian or, or prove that I'm not a Christian. Just because you, you, have, you say you have faith and then you have works, it doesn't make you any, any better Christian than I am. I, I profess Christ. But you can see what James says. James says, show me your faith. Without the works, he, he basically says, look, okay, that's fine. The word there, show, is demonstrate. James basically says, show me. All right, that's fine. You, you say you have faith and you don't care and you, you believe that, that works or no works situation is the same. He calls them out and he says, demonstrate your faith. Demonstrate your faith without deeds and I'll demonstrate my faith by what I do. He turns it back around on them. You see, good deeds demonstrate the reality of your faith. James says, prove it. If you say you can be a Christian without any deeds, that's fine, but let your deeds actually prove you're a Christian. He said, you can say that all you want, but let's, let's let the rubber meet the road. The proof's in the pudding. Look, I, I've had the, the sad experience over the course of my life as I've worked with youth and college ministry, talking to moms, especially moms, over the fact that you know, their kids will be in the church and they grew up in church and they learn biblical principles and even homeschooled and all these things. And they go away to uni, get away from their parents' authority and their parents' belief system, and they live debauched lives. And I've had moms in tears. So I, I remember my son or my daughter was baptized and I don't understand you know, how they could turn their, their back on all the things that I've been teaching them their whole life. But it comes down to the fact that that all the things that they learned is just head knowledge. 
It was just a verbal assent. And when they're out of their parents' authority and they can, they can make their own choices in life, their heart is really demonstrated. And this is sad. You see those things, and, and it breaks my heart. And ultimately, it's in God's hands. And as James is laying out this objector, he's responding, and, and it's like my daughter. My daughter pretends to be animals from time to time. We watch, we watch a lot of nature shows. I like them. They're educational. And my daughter will come up to me or she'll go to my wife and go, Mama or Dada. I, you're, she'll go to Dada, Dada, you're a Dada kangaroo. And, and Mama's a Mama kangaroo. And Brubber's a Brubber kangaroo. And I'm a little baby kangaroo. I'm a Joey. And then, you know, she'll hop around and she'll play like she's an animal. Or, or I'm, I'm a zebra or I'm a horse. And, and uh, just some make-believe. She's four years old, by the way. She's not like 25, just so you know. You know so, you know, she, she has a good time. But... Is she really a kangaroo? No. Right? Doesn't matter how much she believes it, is she really? You know, she hops around. You see, it, it matters what your deeds are. What, what, what's truly, what true your character is. And just so you can see, James keeps responding. And James says in verse 19, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Right? The belief here is, is the same word, pistos. You can translate pistos in the Greek either as faith or belief. Right? And so he's saying basically we know the demons don't have saving faith, and that's why the English translators they tra- uh, uh, translate it as belief, but it's the same word that he's been using the whole time. Right? This is, he's talking about mental assent. Right? He's responding to this, and he's, his intellectual commitment to a series of doctrines or creeds, do not make you a Christian. It's submission to His Word, a trust in Christ for salvation. And James actually says, look, you believe that God is one. This is the the Shema. The Jews would say this. I read it at the beginning when I I welcomed everyone. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The Jews, the pious Jews would say this every morning and every night. And so James is, now this is a primary Jewish church at this time, and so James is saying, look, you believe that God is one. You recite this day and night. And he commends him. He says, well, you do well. Right belief is a good thing, or in the sense of right doctrine, right? There's nothing wrong with their theology. He commends them. But he's basically saying, look, it's, it doesn't matter if you hold orthodox doctrine if your life doesn't demonstrate it in your actions. Look, I went to this get-together, a bunch of <clears throat> high school, uh, year 12 graduated students. You don't say high school here in Australia, but once of high school students, we, we were all in uni and we got together, kind of a, a little reunion. There was probably 10 or 12 of us there and we're all chatting. And I was chatting with this guy I knew very well and and the um, subject of Christianity came up, and so I was basically trying to share the gospel with him, and I made the statement, you know, Christ is God. And another guy who was nearby, who was you know, part of the group, he heard me, and he was kind of sitting, and he, and he piped up, and he said, well, what about this? And he started trying to argue with me, but I cut him off, and I said, look, I don't need you interfering. I don't need your interruption. You're a Mormon. <laughs> I just cut him off, and I continued sharing the gospel with my friend. And ultimately, when it comes to Mormons, they do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They have heterodox theology. It's not consistent with Scripture. They preach a false gospel. In fact, Paul says in Galatians that anyone teaches or preaches a gospel or gives you a gospel uh, that's different than what he has given you, let them be accursed or let them be damned by God. And that's what they are. Right? So I wasn't going to listen to this guy you know, Satan tried to steal a seed away from the, the gentleman I was talking to. Like, so it's so what James is saying here. He's not saying that, that those that proclaim Christ are Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. He's not saying that, that what they're proclaiming is wrong. The, the whole idea of, of God is one, and this is the church here, so they would have affirmed that Jesus Christ is God. So what they're saying is, is not wrong. Right? He's not talking to, to those that hold to heretical beliefs. He's addressing someone that holds to orthodox teaching. But he's asking him, where's the the demonstration in your life? And and what a way to make this point. 
He says the demons believe. Do you realize that, that demons have orthodox theology? They understand exactly who God is. They understand exactly who Christ is. And you can see this. You see this in Mark. Mark chapter 1. Jesus comes across a, a demon-possessed man. And in Mark chapter 1 verse 23, he says, Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, a demon. And he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Demons know exactly who Christ is. Right? But their, their confession, this demon's confession of Jesus Christ, doesn't change their character or their conduct or remove them from future judgment. They know exactly who Christ is, and they will not submit to His Lordship. They exhibit the same useless belief, and this is James' point, they exhibit the same useless belief as the person he's been arguing with, as, as the point he's trying to make. They believe and there's no corresponding actions. And look at this, the demons actually, not only do they believe and they understand who God is, but they shudder. Love the Greek word, it literally means it makes the hair stand up on their arms, on your arms. The demons, demons shudder, their response is fear. That's the only effect their belief in God, their, their orthodox theology has had on them is that they fear God. And they respond in horror. It's like the demon in Mark chapter 1. They, they know their doom is sure. For we know in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, that God does not give help to angels. There's no redemption. There's no salvation for demons. Right? Their, their belief in God doesn't bring them any peace. It doesn't bring them any salvation. James keeps going and follows that train of thought, and he says, But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Are you willing to recognize the truth? And the implication is that, is that the, the person that he's arguing with or the, the person that, that he's responding to is, is resisting the truth. They keep going back to the, their profession of faith. And say, no, but I believed and, and I, I was baptized. And he says, you're a foolish man. You're, you're empty. You're hollow. You're, you're devoid of saving faith and moral sense. And brethren, there's no, there's no such thing as a vacuum when it comes to your heart. There, an absence of, of good, absence of a, a redeemed heart is the presence of an evil one. There's no middle ground. He's a hard-headed, he's a hard-hearted, a stubborn man. He says, oh, foolish man, will you recognize the truth? And what's the truth? That faith without deeds, without actions is useless. He restates his point from verse 17 and verse 14. It's useless. The word useless is, is unproductive. It's like a field that has been left fallow. It's like money that's just sitting in a, in a pile, not producing interest. It's unproductive. The word argos here means idle, unproductive. It's, it's belief that does no good. I had a mom come to me one time and just complaining about her son. And she was saying, oh, I can't believe he's dating an unbeliever. I'm having such a hard time with him. And and I just looked at her and I responded and I said, well, what does it matter? She kind of was taken aback for a second. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. He's an unbeliever himself. He can date whoever he wants. She bristled. <laughs> she, she got upset with me. And she said, well, well, my son grew up in church. He went to Grace Community Church, which is the home of John MacArthur. He's been taught good doctrine all his life. And I, and I knew her son very well. And I knew him outside of her, her home and knew, knew what kind of life he was living. And I just said, look, growing up, hearing good doctrine, growing up, being taught the proper things about God doesn't guarantee salvation. Look, my heart goes out to parents. You know, we, 
my, my kids are young, they're not grown, and I mean, parents, they've been teaching their kids their whole lives. They, they teach them about God and who He is and their condition. They bring them to church. But there's no guarantee that they're going to have saving faith. What a hard truth that is. God never promises that He's going to save our kids. We pray for them. We teach them. We, we teach them about who God is. And I've heard so many parents, they quote Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not part, depart from it. But that's not a promise. Proverbs are wisdom literature. These are general principles. That general principle applies to everything. I teach my son how to grill. When he gets old, he knows how to grill. I teach him how to, you know, fish. When he gets old, he'll know how to fish. Teach him how to do evil, and he'll know how to do evil. It's a general principle. It's not a promise that we can claim. Salvation alone comes from the Lord. And as parents, we, we have to trust the Lord in that. God chooses who He's going to choose. It doesn't mean we forfeit our responsibility. As parents, God's given us those lives as a stewardship. We just pray for our kids and we teach them about God and their sinfulness and their, and their need for Jesus Christ as a Savior. And we trust God. And that's all we can do. Just like we trust God for anyone's salvation that we're praying for, because salvation belongs to the Lord. Brethren, James is, is calling for self-examination. It's like Paul's call to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Paul says, test yourselves to see if you are actually in the faith. Examine yourselves. You see, assurance of salvation is a, is a gift of the Holy Spirit that comes as we're obedient to God's Word. When you think about those that come to faith and those that hear the word, you can't help but think about Luke chapter 8. And I'd like to, we'll close in with this particular passage and a few comments. In Luke chapter 8, verse 4, verse four excuse me, many of you know the parable of the soils. Jesus says, when a, a large crowd was coming together, those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Another seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out. And another seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And he said these things, he who would he who would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. Now verse 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Verse 12, those beside the road, they've heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they will not believe and be saved. We're talking about hard-hearted people who, who hear the word of God. The, the soil is hard, their, their hearts are hard. Verse 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy, and, and these have no firm root, and they believe for a while, and then time of temptation fall away. These are the, they, there's those that hear the word of God, and they even receive the word with gladness and joy. And what do they do? They believe. They, they give mental assent to Scripture. They confess maybe that, that they're saved, and, but then when times of trial come, it demonstrates their true heart. Verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures, and they bring no fruit. So all of these three so far are not, is not true faith. It's not saving faith. They, they either resist the word or, or they, they hear it, but it's not true belief. Or they say they believe and there's no fruit. But then look at verse 15. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, not a hard heart. And what do they do? They hold it fast. They believe it. And they bear fruit. And they persevere. Brethren, right beliefs, right doctrine is important to salvation, but it's not the only thing. It's just the first step. Acting on those beliefs in faith, and demonstrating those beliefs in how you live as Christ has called you to do. Do you love God more than anything else? 
Do you love others as more important than yourself? Salvation is always a gift from God. We're saved by grace. James would heartily agree with this. Test and see whether your faith is, faith is real or merely useless belief. Are there righteous deeds in your life? Obedient living demonstrates an inward change. James has challenged us today to look at our lives and ask ourselves, are we exhibiting true and real faith? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, how, how challenging it is, how important it is as we understand what true faith is. Lord, help us to live lives that show that there has been a change in our lives, change in our hearts. Pray for those that have heard the message this morning and are now beginning to realize that the, the belief that they've professed is not real. I pray for conviction of the Holy Spirit, of the sin still in their lives, the sinful heart, the, the judgment that awaits them, that they may confess their self-deception. They may understand that they've talked themselves into the kingdom but haven't believed truly in their hearts. Pray, O Lord, that you would continue working in our lives. Help us to be an example to others of, of your love in this world. Father, help us to speak boldly to friends and family and help them to not be self-deceived and to think that just because they made a profession at one time in their life, or even if they were baptized, that, that without corresponding good deeds, there's no evidence of salvation. Father, I pray that you would use us all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.